Hello, blogging heads. My name is Betsy Woodruff, and I am a reporter with the Washington Examiner. I cover Capitol Hill and campaigns, and I am here today with my good friend Daniel Strauss, who has basically the same beat at Talking Points Memo. Uh, we always have a delightful time chit-chatting about interesting races going on. Uh, fortunately, there is no dearth of wackiness and excitement in American electoral politics in 2014, so we'll be talking about that for a little bit. Um, but before we kick this off, Daniel had some thoughts about the situation in Ferguson that he wanted to share, and given that that seems like a much more significant national story than things that are going on in some of these random state races, we thought it made sense to start with that. So, Daniel, uh, can you just share some perspective on that? Yeah. Hi, Betsy. Um... So, uh, I, you actually can't see it right now, but in the background I've got uh, MSNBC on right behind me, and there's a, right now they're showing uh, images of the protests and police in, like, heavily armored vehicles and that stuff. So it's like, it's the topic right now for an otherwise, I think, kind of a sleepy August or something. Sure I've been actually thing. wondering what we would be covering and what would be the trending topic if... Uh, Ferguson wasn't going on, but it's definitely um, a thing. Uh, one mm -hmm. thing that seems to be happening more and more, and I saw reports about, uh, I think, a Getty uh, photographer getting arrested this afternoon was uh, the press and how they are handling or really how they're sort of interacting with police in mm -hmm. Ferguson. Um, one of the most... I mean, I, what really started that off and sort of observations about that was two reporters, TPM alum Ryan Riley and the Washington Post's uh, Wes Lowry getting arrested because they uh, could not, uh, apparently, they were in a McDonald's and they, could, they weren't packing up fast enough and they had a confrontation with Ferguson police there where uh, the police officer asked for identification for both of them and essentially arrest them really quickly. Um, and the thing that I think I can, I mean, I haven't been to Ferguson. Um, uh, I would like to weigh in on though is um, being a reporter of color in that situation because Wes is my color. Um, I actually don't know uh, what his ethnicity is, but I am biracial uh, and the, there is a big, I mean, the the core of what's going on in Ferguson has to do with race. It has to do with the death of uh, an 18-year-old named Michael Brown who was uh, shot by a police officer there. Um, and in the situation that Wes was in, I, uh, I have been sort of wondering about what I would do because as uh, a person who is often, I mean, I... I you know, often put in the African-American camp um, and has definitely been taught growing up to be wary of the police and be cautious about, about them. Um, no matter what I'm doing, I don't know what I would have done in that situation if I would have immediately... So, I mean, because I, I'm told growing up uh, to, you know, don't press the police if they ask for your ID, Ask, you know, give them your ID. It's probably going to be unfair, but just do it because it could get worse really badly. Um, but, you know, as a reporter covering uh, something like Ferguson, where there's a lot of racial conflict, you, you know, uh, another reporter pointed out to me yesterday that you shouldn't, put wearing that reporter hat, you shouldn't have to take those extra steps. And there's been a lot of discussion among people I know about, uh, this and uh, in this situation, I think African American reporters, especially the ones covering this, are in kind of a bit of a bind here because they they have to cover this in a way where they can understand and perceive and relay what is going on, including treatment of cops on African American men. Uh, and it's you know it's getting kind of crazy. It's been kind of crazy there, but. Uh, if I were in Wes's position, I still don't know if I would have immediately, um, uh, essentially just sort of 
taken the extra steps, you know, immediately said very slowly, put my hands up, uh, said I'm going to reach into my pocket, I'm going to pull out my wallet, it has my ID in it or what. Um, my understanding is that Wes was very by the book. Um, Ryan, uh, who is a justice reporter and was one of our muckraker reporters back in the day, uh, knew a little bit more. I mean, he's more experienced with dealing with uh, cops and knew to ask for uh, his, the arresting officer's badge number and name, which he didn't get. Um, I don't think I would have known to do that. Um, that is definitely not, I think, something that a lot of African Americans are taught growing up. Mm. Uh, it is not something that I was encouraged to do in that situation, and I'm the son of a lawyer. Um, and, you know, we had, we've, you know, my dad, when I was younger, had talked to me about what you need to do if you do get arrested, who you're going to, I was going to, I was supposed to call a specific lawyer at his law firm, and I think my dad would say, and tell him to get his ass down to the courthouse, or wherever I was. Wow. Um, yeah. So, but at the same time, I, I think in this situation, as a reporter, in sort of a, a zone like this, you, I, I don't know, it, it's hard to, it's hard to sort of say, I, I think it would be important to articulate and to note that sort of dimension of that. Um, and I think with every person, every reporter of color, the situation is different. But for me, I'm not quite sure what I would do. Uh, and I think Wes handled it really well. Um, and I'm not sure I would have handled it as well in that it would have contributed to my reporting as much. Um, so that was, that's my two cents on all of this. Yeah, that's, that's really valuable. And I'm glad that you shared that. I guess one thing that this makes me think about is the fact that, and I don't, I don't want to get myself in trouble saying this because obviously it's important for reporters, especially hard news reporters working for mainstream publications, to strive to be as objective and unbiased as possible. But at the end of the day, you can never truly separate who you are from your reporting. Um, right. I know for me as a woman, when I interview women and when I write about issues that are especially germane to women, uh, and you know, writing about writing about stuff that impacts women more or dif or very differently than it impacts men, I can't turn off the fact that I'm a woman. Um, if I'm writing about a national story and I'm writing about policies about women. Because of my gender, I am necessarily involved in those policies, and I and I can't divorce myself from that. Uh, and I think, and I think sometimes, sometimes the ways that journalism classes or you know conventional wisdom about reporting can approach these questions it can set up this false idol of objectivity that that might not be real. You know, as as a white person, as like the whitest white person ever, I absolutely can't speak to this on a racial level. So I'm, I'm really glad that uh, I got to hear your thoughts on that. But definitely from a gender perspective, I know, like, I, <laughs> I, I can be objective to a point and I can be very honest about who I am. And obviously my name's Betsy. People are going to figure out I'm a woman. Um, but, you know, there's a place where you really can't divorce who you are from the reporting that you do. And uh, I think particularly if you're a reporter of color in Ferguson right now writing about these enormously racially charged, uh, this conflict, I think conflict is the right term to use, um, mm -hmm. that seems, you know, I don't, I don't think we should ever see that as a liability or as, or as a downside. And I don't think that any of the media organizations sending reporters there do. And I hope that readers recognize that the, the extra knowledge these reporters bring is, is really, really valuable and important. It's funny, you know, I saw some of the tweets uh, after, and I think Ryan tweeted, you know, he said something like, you know, I'm a white 20-something uh, male, if, you know, just, and this is how I was treated, imagine how um, people of color were treated, and Wes is one of those people, so we kind of saw that. Um, yeah, sure thing. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's the thing, and I think especially uh, foreign correspondents and war correspondents uh, in the Middle East... Uh, with the gender issue, it's somewhat but not completely analogous. Um, mm -hmm. If you were to be, if you were to report on Syria or something, uh, where uh, gender plays a different role in everyday life, as I understand it, um, mm -hmm. or if you were covering, say, Turkey during the the apex of the burqa ban debates, uh, I, it is a little hard. I mean, it, it's. But at the same time, it's kind of, I, I, I kind of, 
I there is a part of me that does want to hear the reporter. I mean, even not that I judge the capabilities of a reporter covering a gender issue, like an issue about women who happens mm-hmm. to be a woman, that I think they're not objective. And I guess this doesn't quite make sense, but I do, I, I am always interested in reading their reporting. Mm-hmm. Um, so I am especially interested in reading and seeing reporters on the scene in Ferguson of color who aren't white. Um, yeah. Sure you know, thing. which can extend to a broad swath people um without a doubt uh, i think it's a value. but it's funny it doesn't that doesn't quite make sense does it because mm-hmm. uh by saying that aren't i suggesting that they are not being completely deaf uh uh objective or that they are uh essentially uh have a different point of view than the white male reporter who's there i think i think maybe it's not so much I think objectivity can be a false idol in journalism. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's no. obviously a good goal, but it's not the only goal. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a national a core review of model alum, that like... we can do <laughs> reporting without completely hiding yeah. our analysis of a situation. Sure thing. I, I am not an object. I am not going to be 100% objective all the time. And right. I think maybe the big takeaway from this is something that we've talked about before, which is how important it is to have a variety of media sources and to read a variety of journalists. If you, you know, if you're just reading journalism that's done by white men writing for mainstream media publications, you're going to read a lot of really, really good journalism. But yeah. there are going to be very important things you miss. Um, mm-hmm. And if you just read conservative media outlets, you'll again, you'll read a lot of fantastic journalism, but you'll miss important things. Same thing if you just read liberal media outlets. You know, same things if same thing if you just read female reporters. Although mm-hmm. some people would differ on that. Um, I think the the great thing about what the internet has done to journalism is that it's made it very easy and very inexpensive and very simple for people to read an enormous variety of outlets and an enormous variety of reporters. And I think that's awesome. Um, and I think if anything, that makes this this cult of of you know the reporter as a as a dehumanized distant observer who is completely disconnected from the story i think it's made that less important because there's not one correct story that's going to be written you know in the mm-hmm. past when you might have read one newspaper and you were going to read one story on one issue i think i could understand that being the goal more but now you know nobody's just reading one story on one thing i certainly don't think um, and that means that people are going are gonna to figure out what's going on by looking at a variety of sources and a variety of reporters and a variety of perspectives. And I think that gives everybody a better understanding of what's happening. So, I mean... So can we... But before we get on to our usual campaign stuff, I did want to ask you, like, because uh, I, I don't... I Betsy, the reporting I've read from you lately has been on campaign news. I don't know how closely you've been following this. I have not taken the lead on our Ferguson coverage. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, we have a few other writers who are doing that right now, um, and I've written a little, but not. I'm definitely that's not where my focus is right now. Um, mm-hmm. uh, what do you think of this? I mean, it just it, there is something sort of comical about President Obama today holding a, ju- a, a dual statement on Iraq and Ferguson, Missouri, <laughs> where yeah, it's sort of like I agree. you know. He's sending troops somewhere. Which one is it? I don't know. This is an image. It's I don't. Which crazy. one is it? You could, yeah, you could it's, play a guessing game here. Um, it's true, and you and you could also play a guessing game with just the images that are coming out of these two places. Right. You know, you could you could play. You know, is this a picture of Missouri or Baghdad? That that's a serious question. Mm-hmm. Um, it's. I haven't done any reporting on Ferguson. There are so many good reporters in Ferguson right now writing about it. I honestly think I would. I personally, and no judgment on other reporters covering this, but I think I personally would feel a little goofy, given that there's so much really good and interesting and valuable journalism coming from people who are on the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, but just following it, the, the, the images are just shocking. It's funny. Uh, the, the thing I don't really get um, is sort of what continues to fuel a lot of this. I mean, besides mm-hmm. the fact that yeah. it's sort of an arms race that's been going on. I, I don't... Like I, I, the the spark seems to be Brown's death, um, and the police response and their use of uh, military surplus gear that is, I think, some might say excessive. Which a I little bit, 
<laughs> a little bit. A little bit. Um, <laughs> I uh, hope. I hope it's not <laughs> normal for every single police force to have tanks. <laughs> if that's, I mean, if that's the point that we're at, we have I, we have some sort of problem. <laughs> Either we have excessive police force, or we live in a country where you have to have military grade equipment to get people to right. a lot. And so, both of those problems are So the, the like, sense I'm getting from this is that what's really escalating it is is sort of it, it's it's a twofold thing. It's this this sort of unclear series of events about the shooting of an 18-year-old African American male by a white police officer. And then uh, some kind you know a, a quick sort of movement or objection by the local African-American population and then um, an angry, uh, a very, a very uh, iron-fisted response by police to this. Mm -hmm. um, sure thing. And I, you can, I guess, when if, if I were to explain that to someone who didn't really understand it, it, it makes a lot of sense. You are dealing with... <clears throat> A racially charged sort of subject in a state that has let me I because I used to know this they were I think you gotta check me on this um, they were pro what is it uh, they they had some we Missouri had some weird sort of status during the Civil War they were yeah. like they occupied supported, they by supported. the North. They supported but, slavery, but they also didn't want to secede and right. supported the Union forces. So, right. yeah. Yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and, you know, I, uh, we're, we both spent, I mean, we both went to college in Michigan, but I spent my freshman year at the University of Missouri in Columbia. And I don't know, oh, actually. Interesting. Yeah, I was born uh, in Columbia. Really? We lived, so yeah, we, we just, lived there until yeah. I was eight. Yeah, just missed so each and, other. Yeah, we just, uh, <laughs> something like that. And we both went to school in Michigan. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So. Interesting. And actually Making both of my. Note. Yeah. The founding editor of TPM, Josh Marshall, is from St. Louis. And the managing editor, David Kurtz, is, went to law school there at Mizzou. But um, I don't. I remember um, having. I mean, Columbia is a pretty. As far as towns in the Midwest. Smaller towns in the Midwest and sort of uh, southern-ish uh, location. So it's not that bad, but coming from highly diverse uh, communities, it was kind of a shock to me when I was there. Um, and there was definitely... I mean, there were... there were, there were I wasn't the only person of color, but um, there is a, a definite sort of difference. And I think if the farther south you get in that state, the... Uh, more notable some differences along racial lines are um, yep. uh, and I think that is sort of also a factor in this um, hmm. you know and the last thing I want to say on this is that I, I think you know going into the Obama presidency um, in 2008 there was all this discussion of about how there would be a you know if this would be a post-racial presidency if like one of the big changes we would see was would be a new sort of national outlook and national sort of sentiment toward race and racial differences. Um, but again and again, we have these horrible instances that really highlight the racial tensions in our country with Trayvon Martin and now Michael Brown um, mm -hmm. and the president having to address that. Um, it's, it's funny because, I, I, you know, I just feel like the farther, I mean, we have a two-term African American president. Who, I mean, twenty years ago, people would say that's. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, yeah, no kidding. And yet, we're still dealing with these sort of Rodney King esque situations. Um, so obviously, there is a long way to go uh, for race in America, even when the first. African American president leaves the White House. No kidding. Yeah. So, do you want to talk about campaigns now? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure thing. And okay. I'm I'm glad we talked about Ferguson. Yeah, That's you're a little quiet really now, Betsy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I I don't I I agree with you. It's 
you know, 2008, I remember 2007, people thought we were never going to have a black president, or at least not in in our lifetime. But uh, Yeah. It's I funny, think, my, my African American, yeah. my black mother was very much like, it could happen, and my white father, mm-hmm. who was definitely, you know, associating with my mother and sort of being in uh, a, a biracial couple when it was very much not okay to be a biracial mm-hmm. couple, um, had completely different views. My dad was completely pessimistic uh, hmm, about all this. And, I mean, he's he's pessimistic, too, because he, like, didn't think Rahm Emanuel in Chicago um, was Jewish. Uh, th- he didn't think the city of Chicago could elect a Jewish mayor. Um, uh, and there are sort of ethnic, historical sort of reasons for that, which are notable in the same way. Um, but. Yeah. I think even among a community or the population, the sort of the biracial population of America, there is not a complete sense that this is all over um, by a long shot. And that's why that's why they're telling their children like me to you have to be particularly careful about around police officers. And that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Um, Hmm. And that sort of changes uh, when you're a reporter. (laughs) Yeah, and uh, and obviously not to equate racial politics with gender politics because those differences themselves are different, which mm-hmm. we know. Um, but I think it's but I think it's it's very it's a very similar sense with women, where mm-hmm. women are better represented in Congress than they've ever been historically. Um, women are wealthier as a as a block of, of people in America have have control of more money than mm-hmm. we ever have historically. More women are running Fortune 500 countries than companies than ever. More women are running countries around the globe than ever. Yeah. Um, I mean, pick almost any metric, and women are doing way, way better, just have way more power than they did decades ago. But at the same time, and actually, this is a pretty good segue for our for our campaign conversation. At the yeah. same time, women who women still face uh, enormous barriers and mm-hmm. and a lot of systemic ingrained sexism that. It, that just you know, makes things harder than they should be. Yeah. Um, obviously not the same as the challenges people of color face, but but I think perhaps similar in the sense that we keep being like, why are we still talking about this? <laughs> why is this still an issue? Why do we still have to talk about media sexism? Why are right. we still have so to talk it's about, not, I mean, you know, like, you know, it's, it's also you know, keep in mind. It's like, the, right. It's like the know. farther along we get, you know, and the, and the, and the more progress we make and the more comfortable we get, even just talking about these things. Also at the same time, the more acutely aware I think we become of how much more stuff needs to be done. Um, right. and, and if anything, this frustration is, is symptomatic of, a lot of progress has been made in the last decades and, you know, centuries. <laughs> mm-hmm. So with that said, uh, next on the Iowa, agenda, right? we, Iowa, oh. we, yes, we've got three states we're going to be talking about, Iowa, Kansas, and Montana. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think actually this conversation about uh, gender politics is exactly what we're we'll talking about with Iowa. Um, there yeah. was a really interesting Time Magazine article that you pointed out to me uh, that I probably should have seen on Twitter but somehow missed about Joni Ernst in Iowa. And this is something I'm curious for your for your answer to this question, Daniel. You know, given we've both looked at this article, uh, do you think you know Democrats like like Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the DNC chair, have charged right. that Joni Ernst, who's the Republican Senate nominee in that state, is Iowa's Sarah Palin or the next Sarah Palin? Um, mm-hmm. And this is a charge that gets leveled at. <laughs> almost every single Republican woman running for office. You know, Mother Jones just had a magazine cover about Susana Martinez, but the cover didn't say her name on it at all, I don't think. It just had a picture of the outline of Sarah Palin's head, and it said the next Sarah Palin. And as this Time magazine notes, uh, Kelly Ayotte, who is certainly not a, not beloved by Sarah Palin, was called the next Sarah Palin. Deb Fisher in Nebraska who won her Senate race was called the next Sarah Palin. It's just this meme that we hear over and over. Do you think, what are your thoughts on characterizing female Republican candidates as the next Sarah Palin? Do you think it's appropriate? Do you think it's helpful? So you can see, I mean, one thing we've seen this entire cycle is that the the approach of the Democratic committee and Democrats in general is to paint their opponents as uh, extremists. And Mm -hmm. over and over again, you'll see fundraising pitches from the arguably the most persistent uh, political committee in the history of the world, the Democratic Congressional like Campaign little. Committee, uh, yeah. constantly okay, warning about the Tea Party, and not so much warning about uh, the GOP, but you know, trying to equate right. 
these top candidates. And, you know, I, I think we can say at this point the Iowa Senate race between Braley and um, Ernst is a toss-up. Um, I mean, the goal, the way Democrats feel they can win or at least do well in these races is by painting these candidates as these highly polarizing figures like Sarah Palin. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the, 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 the timepiece was really good, I thought, um, because it, it, I mean, even it, on the surface, it said, you know, Ernst is not like Sarah Palin, but uh, the writer, J. Newton Small, pointed out that, you know, rising up, Palin was not the sort of cringe machine that uh, many painted her as and consider her as when she ran on the 2008 presidential ticket. Uh, she sure was thing. very popular, and she rose quickly, and she was, uh, she what to use her phrase, she shook things up. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Ernst is, I mean, and she didn't always go along with what, uh, I'm going to borrow another Palinism, like the good old boys in Alaska. Um, yeah. Good old boys Ernst isn't a Palinism. Is, Good old yeah, boys I mean, I guess that's something like that. I don't, <laughs> you know, good old boys. Ernst is, Ernst is, I mean, the, a few things about this. Ernst is, as, as, as far as I know, um, is in a tighter race, and she's had an uphill climb this whole time. Uh, she's never really been coasting, at least this cycle, um, mm-hmm. and she just, she's done pretty well. Um, yeah. Her name recognition skyrocketed through these two really effective ads. Um, so, I, I, I mean, the reason I, I think we're seeing Democrats paint the, her this way is because she has some positions that they that they know will galvanize supporters around them and by labeling that as the next Sarah Palin um Mm -hmm. they that's the best way to encapsulate that um and I I, think Sargent or someone said today that like yeah I don't think she's Sarah Palin but I think some of her views are very conservative um and problematically so uh I, and I think that's, that might be the truth about her. I mean, yeah. the thing is, what's great about this race. Well, and she's, I mean, look, to, she's, she's conservative. She's unabashedly yeah. conservative. She's made but no is, bones about her conservative. I mean, she's a remarkable a candidate and she's the only candidate that has been able to get uh, the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and Senate Conservatives Fund to back her. I mean, she's yeah. the only candidate that Without the National Republican Senatorial Committee and uh, Senate Conservatives Fund agree on those Look, guys. She's, hate she's each other. the she's the kumbaya candidate. Yeah, everybody likes her, um, and understandably so because I, I think you know on paper she's very formidable. She mm-hmm. served a tour of duty in Iraq. She runs the largest National Guard battalion in Iowa. She's been a state legislator. She's a mom. She rides motorcycles. Yeah. I, I mean, this is this is a formidable, serious person. This isn't right. Christine O'Donnell. This isn't Sharon Angle. She's she knows what she's doing. And yeah, I think you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think she might be the only candidate this cycle who's been endorsed by both Senate Conservatives Fund, a very conservative organization that uh, that uh, then Senator Jim Demint helped kick off to make the Senate yeah. more conservative, and also by Mitt Romney. Who's Just, kind of been you know, a, I, an establishment candidate kingmaker? You know, yeah. she's she's been very very effective. Um, mm-hmm. And I think, I don't know. It's 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 interesting seeing, uh, you know, a mainstream non ideological reporter calling out Democrats for using this the next Palin line. Mm-hmm. Um, what because I you know I think I think his perspective there is very smart. Um, I think the next Palin has become a cliche. I think it's lazy. I think mm-hmm. it no longer communicates valuable information to readers. Mm-hmm. Um, I think at least from a journalistic perspective, it's it's come to basically mean nothing. The next Palin means the next Republican woman. And because of the way it's used, it's fundamentally pejorative and and uh, fundamentally has you know has a, is biasing, you know, biases mm-hmm. readers. So yeah. I you know, I really I really liked his article and I you know, I'd be interested yeah. To hear, to hear a rebuttal from perhaps a Democratic spokesperson who thinks that it's appropriate to call every Republican woman running for office the next Sarah Palin. Right. Um, I. Uh, I don't think I. I don't think you're gonna hear. I mean, I, I think there are Democrats who are very wary to call the senators from Maine the next Sarah Palin. Um, yeah, but they but they predate Palin. 
Right, but they do predate. And also them. only one. All now, these, Olivia all these, right. So you know, uh, I, I think that's that's definitely true. Uh, you know, I uh, I have seen. It's funny because I've also seen. I'm still waiting for. I, I think I, I think I have seen a little bit of sort of using like an Elizabeth Warren Democrat pejoratively. Yeah, but I don't, I don't even think that's pejorative but because Democrats use that too. Like Democrats yeah, say we're like right. Elizabeth so the, Warren. Right. So the P triple C. Yeah. This they I mean, they when, are very they really want to peg the candidates they support as like the right. the Elizabeth Warren wing of the Democratic Party. Totally. Um, yeah. Much the yeah. same way, but like I, what's most interesting to me about. Uh, Ernst right now, and we're getting into the weeds a little bit here, was on Friday she said that she had been sexually harassed in the military and um, sort of said that she, I mean, she sort of aligned herself with, um, she wants to remove certain kinds of sexual harassment and abuse cases in the military from the chain of command, which aligns Mm -hmm. with, (laughs) I love this, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, one of the more liberal senators in mm-hmm. the United States Senate. The rub here is but, that one of the co-sponsors of her bill that fell five uh, votes short of making it through a filibuster in the Senate was one Ted Cruz. Um, so and, and Cruz, another and another vocal, visible supporter of her bill that was only five votes short was Senator Rand Paul. Right. Um, so. I, I want to know, Betsy, if, like, you expect Ernst... Uh, right now she says she's going to work with uh, lawmakers when she... Uh, to craft a bill, and she says she's not jumping behind Gillibrand's bill. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, could you see her... I mean, because the bill isn't moving anywhere, but if they were to give it another go and Gillibrand said, I'm going to name it something else, it's going to be the exact same thing, but we're going to pretend it isn't, could you mm-hmm. see Ernst signing on to that? Yes, without a doubt. And here's why. Because I've written a decent amount about the military sexual assault issue, and the central point of contention, as far as I can tell, is this question of having military sexual assault cases be convened outside the chain of command. I did not know what that term meant until I started writing about it, Um, but people who are a lot more knowledgeable about this than I am have basically explained that what chain of command means is... Is that, uh, so for instance, if, if a person is charged, if a soldier is charged with committing sexual assault, then mm. his commander gets to decide whether or not there's a hearing on that case. Um, and, and the decision of whether or not to convene a military court is made within the chain of command. In other words, the soldier's commander is, is responsible for enacting justice on him. You know, his, you know, you're responsible for your subordinates if you're a commander. That's mm. the way it's been in the military forever. That's the military's stance. Military is very, very dogmatic about the importance of these cases being heard in the chain of command. I mean, the Pentagon is is diehard on this. So, so asterisk, you know, when Ernst sides with Gillibrand, she's going against the Pentagon. That's a very big deal. Yeah. Um, but but the case that opponents of this make, you're know, the case that, and I don't I don't like to use the word reformer here because it implies that I support what they're doing, and I and I really don't have a position on this. I am, you know definitely not knowledgeable enough to say whether or not one or these things would be more, would be a better way to prevent military sexual assault. Um, but what Jill Rand, Cruz, and Rand Paul, as well as numerous others, you know, 55 senators support, is having these military sexual assault cases, whether or not they're tried, having that be decided by someone other than the soldier's commander. So having that be tried by, by a lawyer in the Pentagon or another authority who is not directly responsible for the soldier. I think the basic argument in, you know, using small words in layman's terms is that that would eliminate a commander's bias in favor of his soldier, and that mm-hmm. would make it so that people, so that, for instance, women and also men who say they are a victim of sexual assault might not have to go directly to their commander, you know, might not potentially face repercussions, which unfortunately seems to have been what happens to many of these people who allege that they've been victims of sexual assault. That's terrible. Right. Um, right. So the reason, so the reason that Ernst's stance is is really fascinating and important is that on this central issue, that seems to be the major sticking point for you know these forty five senators uh, on this central issue of whether or not these military sexual assault cases are heard in the chain of command. Ernst is against the Pentagon. 
against the bulk of the Republican Party, against Carl Levin, the Democratic chair of the Senate Armed Services Committee, against Claire McCaskill, a female Democratic senator who very vocally, very visibly defended hearing these cases in the chain of command. And as far as I'm concerned, the fact that Ernst was willing to cross that line and willing to to stand against, I, I think it might even be in the Republican Party platform, although I'm not positive, so double check me on that. But at no, least no, to stand no, against... No, no, it is. You're right. It I'm is. Right. Okay, yeah. At least to disagree with the Republican Party platform and with the position of the Pentagon as a Republican active duty service member is is really, really significant. That's mm. the biggest line she has to cross, and I'm confident that if she gets elected, this is going to be a big issue for her. And, you know, well, and, and understandably so, because she's a woman and she's dealt with sexual harassment in the military, so she knows what she's talking about. Well, uh, it's hard to think um, of somebody who would have more moral authority, um, or, or at least more basic authority on this issue than uh, Ernst. Right. I mean, one thing I guess we can be sure about then, because I, Braley, I think, is a sure vote for um, yes. Gillibrand's Bra- bill, too, is that whoever wins Braley this is. thing... Braley also supports taking right. these and sexual assault hearings outside the chain of command. And he's airing veterans' yeah. ads now, too. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah. whoever comes well. out of this primary is going to uh, mm-hmm. be another uh, a, a helpful vote. Uh, it's a helpful vote. It's not an additional vote because it's filling Harkin's Harkin. seat, and right. Harkin also voted to take us out of the chain of command. So as right. far as I can tell, the only significant political difference, the only way this would change the political calculus, I doubt Braley's going to change the political calculus. It's another non-military man voting the same way. But I think mm-hmm. if Ernst did, you have a female military member who's a Republican voting for this legislation, and I think that makes it easier for Republicans to stomach passing it. So mm-hmm. I think I think Ernst maybe if she signs up for the bill, she hasn't said she's says. going to. Right, yet. if she signs up for the but, bill, but if it's an issue, if they have time to get to it. Yeah, right. assuming ISIS hasn't melted down the entire Middle East by then, right. uh, and they can get around to it. Exactly. Okay. Good talk on Iowa. You want to talk about Kansas? Yeah, now? we're we're supposed to do two more. We're supposed to do Montana and Kansas. Uh, yeah. I can briefly go on Kansas, cool. which is really interesting to me because uh, Sam Brownback, the Tea Party governor. Um, had uh, a kind of close primary, um, and he's yeah. trailing in the general election to Paul Davis, the mm-hmm. House minority leader and the top Democrat there. Um, and as yeah. far as I can understand it, a lot of this is um, sort of objection to uh, Brownback. He his uh, primary challenger Jennifer Wynn was did not have a lot of money. Um, she did not have a lot of name recognition, but she did something like. Th- she managed 30, 30, upwards of 30% of the vote, um, which is impressive for a candidate mm-hmm. that didn't do so well. Um, sure thing. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, it's funny. It's um, Tim Hulskamp had kind of a scare in his primary, too, um, and he's a big Tea Party favorite in Kansas. Um, and for a minute, me and my editor was like, is this going to be Cantor round two again? Um, but it wasn't. Uh, so in Kansas, we're seeing at least uh, some kind of uh, some kind of objection to some of these big-name tea partners. Um, I don't know how Davis is going to do uh, in the general election. It's just sort of started. Um, he has been able to get some mainstream Republicans there to back him, which is a mm-hmm. big coup. Um, uh, it might. It looks like it might be a win there. Um, national Democrats are eager to take the seat now that it looks like this governor's mansion. Now that it looks like they can, mm-hmm. um, but uh, we're, we're we'll have to see on that one. Can I? Okay, so I just I just found a, a kind of a fun brown back fact, yeah. and this is more interesting because it shows the significance of the Jennifer Wynn protest vote. So Mm -hmm. in Mitch McConnell's primary against Matt Bevin, which was a very high profile race where Bevin had support from deep pocketed Republican or conservative organizations, national conservative organizations, and where Bevin also was able to self fund. You know, RCP says Bevin got 35% of the primary vote. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jennifer Wynn who nobody had heard of on a national scale, or at least many of us hadn't heard of, guilty, uh, on a national scale, got 37% of the primary vote. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's, what's all that's politics not, is local, I think. And this it's is true, yeah, which is about, the same thing with cancer, like, yeah. Right. It's, uh, I think, one of the problems with 
in with these you know primary challengers to cycle a lot of the time is that what they really need they don't need national politicians backing them they need local politicians they right. need politicians actually, in the state <clears throat> that, and that's an interesting thing with the brownback campaign too is that one of the things that made brownback stand out the most thus mm -hmm. far in his gubernatorial tenure is that he endorsed the primary challengers of a number of state legislators who were republicans but who opposed his tax cut agenda so he made it. a lot yeah, so he made a lot of Republican enemies, and, and a lot of those guys were voted out. So it was effective. Um, he got them voted out, and with these new, more conservative state legislators, he was able to pass his tax-cutting agenda. But in the process, it sounds like he made a lot of enemies, and now, I mean, if you go to Paul Davis's, I'm just going to do it. If you go to Paul Davis's uh, For Governor campaign page, I think at the very top, at least as of a couple days ago, hang on, let me pull it up. Paul Davis for Kansas. Right, so yeah, the first thing you see is over 100 Republicans for Kansas values right. endorse Davis. Literally, you go to this website, website comes up, it says Davis, Governor, Republicans. The word Democrat, right. hang know. on, let me, they let me control really, F this. They're very realistic There's The word this. Democrat they is not to. on the homepage of this guy's, of this guy's website. And understandably so, Kansas is pretty darn red. Uh, but yeah, I mean, hey guys, friendly reminder, all politics is local, maybe you've heard this one before. So it's going to be an exciting race. It wasn't supposed to be an exciting race. I'm not no, it wasn't. It was but, right. It was supposed to be, but this one, uh, this one might come for Democrats. You know, if they do lose the Senate, and I, um, I think it's going to be close. I totally. Uh, I don't totally. really know what's going to happen. I think it's going to be super close. Um, my no my prediction for... from where I'm sitting is that Brownback pulls it off. Um, really. Yeah, I'm. I'm. You think incumbency? That. I mean, this is one of the things we've learned in the cycle, and this is one of the things we learned. Uh, most recently in the Democratic primary in Hawaii, which is that incumbency makes a big difference. Just when yeah. you get down to it, basically, although there are exceptions, it's really, really hard to knock out incumbents. It just it's really is. hard to knock out incumbents. It's really hard to knock out Republicans in Kansas. Um, I think it's far enough out that Brownback and his people have time to to wage a very effective campaign. It's not going to sneak up on him the way Dave Bratt snuck up on Eric Cantor. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think Brownback really, really wants it. I mean, look, this guy was in DC meeting with reporters a couple of months ago at Americans for Tax Reform. Grover Norquist talks about how, ooh, Brownback 2016, is he going to run for president as a dark horse? We don't know. Maybe he'll run for president. We don't know. Like, this is, this is a guy who is ambitious, who's used to being on the national scene, you know, from when he was in the Senate, I think on the Foreign Relations Committee, and who is no slouch. And he was a smart politician. So my, my prediction is he pulls it off. But I could be wrong. And it'll be exciting no matter what. <laughs> well, one thing we know that's not going to happen is that Senator John Walsh is not going to pull off a win in the U.S. Senate race. Good segue, man. Yeah. That was I, good. You know, I, I like that. that. Yeah, that was uh, nice. I like how you did that. <laughs> he, I mean, he was, he was, he was facing a tight, bold, tight bold race Bold prediction. Before. Big if true. Right. right. I... <laughs> I, I bet good money. I bet all the little, all the dollars, single dollars I have in my bank account right now. Um, he, Hashtag journalism. Uh, yeah. We're not, we're not in it for the money, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, it's all the women. Well, anyway. Hey, um, hey, man. <laughs> uh, Montana. You meet um, lots of delightful women in journalism. I'm just No, saying. there are lots of delightful women in journalism. It's just, uh, uh, anyway. Uh... We need to have a special Daniel Strauss from. We Andy do Wells not have to. Okay, we're going to stop this right now. I'm going to pitch that. There are, there are sort of updates in my dating life, which we're not going to get into, which Betsy and I briefly <laughs> went over at a recent journalist party because that's what you do at these things. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, anyway, so Montana. Um, uh, so Montana. So 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 so, so here's John something Walsh, interesting. Since last we met, John Walsh. Uh, was caught in a plagiarism scandal, um, and he dropped out. They, uh, over the weekend, just uh, nominated a new Democratic candidate. She, Her, her name is Curtis. Yep, um, Amanda Curtis. She, yeah, Amanda Curtis, first-term uh, state lawmaker. She's got mm -hmm. an uphill battle. Um, the question that's a, that's is... That's a nice way of putting it. That's, right. That's generous. The question, yeah. I, mean, I would say she has, you know, like, a vertical battle. She's got three months to up her name recognition. She has to, <laughs> if I were her, I would be calling... Joni Ernst's ad person who did the cat, hog yeah. cast, castration no ad. No kidding, say, right? You know, whatever you want, just make me an ad like that. Um, yeah, actually. You you know, uh, the question is at this point, um, 
is how does this factor to whether the GOP can win the Senate, which is the million yeah. dollar question of this election cycle. Yeah. And uh, right now, real, real clear politics puts um, Montana Senate race as likely GOP, I think. Um, it mm -hmm. is not one of the nine seats that are in play. Democrats yeah. definitely stressed for a long time uh, that um, that seat was in, pay, in play, and it was an obvious move by Democrats to uh, name Walsh uh, senator when uh, Max Baucus left to use, I mean, so Montans could get used to the who idea Who was in of charge senator. of vetting that guy? Who was like, this is the guy who can win. This is you our know, guy. I, uh, like. Who, I just, I, I'm think, just, I, think I just wonder what the vetting process is like because it seems like a no-brainer to go through papers and be like, oh, did you plagiarize hundreds and hundreds of words of your master's thesis? Oh, you plagiarize them. Maybe you shouldn't be running for Senate. You know, like you just think that. So, I, I don't you know, know, you would, but I. It's funny because there. I mean, Andrew Kaczynski reports on uh, has highlighted examples of plagiarism by a, a mm -hmm. number of candidates this cycle, but yeah. it didn't. It hasn't Tons. really stuck the way it's that insane. this. Right, it's this amazing. one really brought him down. Yeah. And I guess well, the, the really 2020 crazy. hindsight to this is that, uh, you know, Democrats based his qualifications largely around his military background. He served in the National Guard. Um, it was his master's thesis at the Army mm -hmm. War College. Uh, and here it is. I, you know, I, I don't know. It just is one of those things that was really yeah. crippling. It was just, it was written by Jonathan Martin of the New York Times and, you know. Jonathan I, Weisman, I think. Jonathan Weisman. Oh, Jonathan Weisman? I'm pretty oh. sure. Let's let's uh let's give it a Google. Okay, you're giving me a Google. Um, I'll Google. You you keep talking. Okay. Uh. Well, and so in the end, I mean that really did it. Um, I don't I I don't know if it really changes the calculus. I don't see yeah. it as one of the six seats that are in play. But I would have to go back. I personally was always skeptical about this, and I'm still skeptical about South Dakota, which someone yeah. was saying to me today could be the sleeper for Democrats. I don't really think so. Um, so to interrupt, I, you're correct. You were right. I was wrong. It's by Jonathan Martin. Jonathan Martin. Yeah. I doff my hat to you. Um, you. so yeah. Uh, what's your, what's your Montana prediction? I, I think, I, I, I think that it's going to be an uphill battle. Um, I think that's not a prediction. Who do you think wins? I, you know, I, uh, Betsy, I, um, everyone I thinks think, it's going to be an uphill battle. I think battle. Steve Danes, uh, yeah has a strange sort of incumbent incumbency status because his title has never changed. He hasn't plagiarized mm -hmm. anything. Uh, yeah. And no one really knows who Amanda Curtis is so far. And Amanda Curtis doesn't really know who she is yet. She's still figuring out her policy positions on a number of issues. Yeah. I mean, the thing right. about being a senator is that you have to, you are required at these points to know a range of issues from like foreign policy yeah. to, uh, I, I don't know, very serious economics uh, mm -hmm. and Americans want every man who don't really know about this because they're normal right. people. So um, given that you're so, making a non prediction prediction. I think <laughs> I think that Danes right now is in control. But not you a know, prediction, we don't, Daniel. We don't, what? Not a prediction. I just predicted Brown Bag's gonna win. You have to make a prediction. <sighs> if you don't want to, you can tap out. But I, just I don't think know. that Danes has a good chance right now. Okay, fair enough. So uh, fair enough. And I think, and I think also, like at this point, at the very least, that's the general consensus. You know, mm -hmm. people are calling this a safe Republican. I talked to a former member of the Montana Democratic Executive Committee today, mm -hmm. who said, and I quote, of Amanda Curtis, she doesn't have a chance in hell, or something to that effect. Uh, um, no. So here's, can I can I change the direction of this a little bit? Because Absolutely. I'm curious for your thoughts on this. Um, I'm operating under the assumption that Danes wins. I think Curtis is unvetted. She has a YouTube channel where she says interesting stuff, like I'm an anarchist at heart. Um, she is, you know, obviously very inexperienced. She hasn't run statewide before. She doesn't have an apparatus. She doesn't have field offices. She doesn't have fundraising. Democrats are, are frantic to keep hold in North Carolina and Arkansas and Alaska. And I think if I'm a national Democratic donor, I'm not giving money to Montana. I'm giving money to uh, Mark Pryor and Mark Begich and Kay Hagan. That's where my money's going. Um, if I'm, if I'm a national Democrat, I write off Montana. I say, bummer, Republicans get that one. We're going to invest our resources in races that are more winnable. So here's, yeah, here's I mean, what I'm doing. Democrats here's never really here's, liked whoever had that seat for a long time. Well, and that's exactly what I'm getting to. What I'm getting to <laughs> is, here's what's interesting to me about Montana, is that the Montana progressives, I, I called a bunch of them last week, never liked John Walsh. 
John Walsh was seen as the establishment Max Baucus pick. He was seen as, as you know, backroom Helena dealing. The fact that the state's Democratic Party endorsed John Walsh in the primary, when the primary could have been competitive, really upset a number of Montana progressives. Mm-hmm. Um, they never liked him. So when he stepped down, you know, they were breaking out the palm hobs, popping champagne, very happy about it. None of them liked him. They didn't think he could win. And Amanda Curtis is sort of a, a breath of fresh air, a new lease on life. For progressives in Montana. Progressives in Montana get to say Amanda Curtis is one of us. She's very progressive. And, you know, based on her votes, based on her stances, she definitely is. Um, you know, Bob Brigham, who I talked to today, said, Mon- said that Amanda Curtis is the Elizabeth Warren of Montana. Not being pejorative there. Being very, you know, being very supportive of, of her stances. Right. And w- what I'm interested in is, and this is based on something that Brigham told me, what I'm interested in is... Does, does Amanda Curtis do better statewide than the Democrats' House nominee? I think I want to say his name is John Lewis, although I could yeah. be getting that wrong. John yeah. Lewis, yeah. Because John Lewis is a former Bacchus aide. He's part of this establishment Democratic circle. Um, you know, he's, he's not progressive. He's not at all radical. He's going to toe the line. He's not going to say anything wacky. Um, and when he gets to Congress, he's he's going to be voting. My my guess would or my guess would be he votes in the House, kind of the way Manchin votes in the Senate. He votes mm-hmm. to cover his butt, um, which is understandable. Which is you know Republicans in blue states do the exact same thing. Not poo pooing that, but uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see if progressives do better statewide or if Max Baucus's folks do better statewide. And I think that will be an interesting indicator of this state of democratic politics in Montana and potentially in other Mountain West states where where they they kind of are in this squirrely world where Democrats sometimes win but Republicans dominate on a presidential level and where what democratic politics looks like is a lot more libertarian and sort of ruggedly individualistic than you might expect from democratic politics in large East Coast population centers or California or Oregon. so, I'm curious what you think about okay, that. Okay, so, so, uh, <laughs> and, you are, uh, if you have any Gnostic insight this. into Montana progressive world, yeah. Right. I, I hate to, uh, so, my, my state strength is not Montana. Uh, we <laughs> okay, do have, I mean, the, I'm surprised you didn't mention the big name out of Montana, who is Brian Schweitzer, who is not, I mean, he yeah. is sort of associated Former with big that big wing, but like, yeah, without he, a doubt. Yeah, the but progressives not... who dislike Bacchus really like Schweitzer. Right. And I think Bacchus and Schweitzer... and Schweitzer might personally dislike each other. That's right. what I've heard. Yeah, I, like, yeah. they're not I, I think I think about. Brian Schweitzer can be a polarizing figure within the Democratic Party, and a lot of people don't like him. Yeah, no shock. Um, and he's said some things uh, recently that are kind of kind of upset Gator. Democrats. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, he he's kind of a wild card. Um uh, and he said very quickly that he was not going to uh, seek the to re- replace um, Walsh as the Democratic nominee for Senate. Um, but uh, I, I I think I I don't know I Montana is a weird place because it's one of these places like um, kind of like Iowa or not Iowa Arkansas where. You have, I mean, all, the recipe says it should be just a plain red state and it should be dull. But there are some Democrats there. Yeah. Um, and they some have of those two Democratic Democrats, senators right now. Two. Right. Um, and some of those uh, Democrats are not necessarily aligned with the Democratic Party as closely as in other states. Uh, so it is kind of hard. Right. It, it is up to the Joe local Manchin party Democrats. to survive on their own in a lot of situations. And mm-hmm. um it is similar to like uh, I'm trying to th- uh, it, it it is similar to what may actually be the situation in Illinois uh, soon mm. with um, Bruce Rauner who is uh, in the lead over uh, incumbent Governor Pat Quinn um, where the local party that does own these uh, big important seats don't exactly. Um, fit with the hue of the state otherwise. Um, and I think that's the situation in Montana. Um, you know, they're on borrowed time there. Maybe maybe it's actually, maybe the best analogy is like West Virginia, where it's starting to yeah, look like... Yeah, I think so. I think yeah. so. Because West Virginia um, has two Democratic senators, but it's voted for... And a Obama Democratic McCain. governor. Democratic right. governor, but the state legislature is controlled. I'm pretty sure. Uh, maybe not totally controlled. Democrats might have the West Virginia state legislature. But I'm pretty sure... Ah, never mind. 
I don't know who controls state legislatures in, in West Virginia and Montana. But yeah, like these states that vote for Republican presidential candidates but have two Democratic senators, and their Democratic senators aren't aren't Elizabeth Warren, if yeah. that makes sense. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, it's it's kind of fun. Right. I enjoy it. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, right? Well, Betsy, I think that's it. We, uh, we clocked in an that's... hour. Pretty good. Yeah, good, talk. good job. All right, uh, I will see you in a few weeks when we do this again. Yeah, sure thing. All right. Have a great evening. Goodbye, Internet. Bye.